Anton Pan Baker with Komodo Group and today I want to be showing you the mathematical mesh and in use. Uh, this is a project we've been working on in the lab now for a couple of years and the objective of the mesh is to make computers easier to use and also more secure. If you use the mesh it will automatically configure strong cryptographic security that you are in complete control of. So for this example, since this is a cryptography example, we don't use A, B and C in crypto anymore. We use Alice and Bob. And so I've got Alice here, uh, courtesy of Scott Adams. Well, not courtesy at all, I didn't ask him. Um, so Alice is going to be our example user. She knows all about crypto, of course. She's a, an engineer and an experienced programmer. However, she doesn't want to be thinking about the security. She wants the security to just happen because she wants to be thinking about her projects, not make work. So what we're going to be doing is using the mesh to enable the encryption that's already here in the platform. Windows has been shipping with an email client that does e secure email for oh, 20 years. And so is the Mac, and so does Linux. It's been built into the platform, but using it takes a lot of time and effort and knowledge. And it doesn't need to be that way. So what we have here is I've got the, just to show people that there's nothing configured yet, um, this is the email security tab. And as you can see, there's no certificate registered. I'll explain what that is in a moment. Um, I've sent Alice a secure email and as you can see uh, it's digitally signed but I couldn't send it encrypted because Alice didn't have an encryption certificate at the time. So I can reply to it, I can send some text to hello and I can send an encrypted reply. but. That reply can only be read by me. It can't be read by Alice because she doesn't have a way of decrypting that message. Now, if you look here in the folder, okay, test sign mail, can't decrypt it. And that's because we're not one of the authorized recipients. So how do we sort all that out? Well, let's shut this down and we will start configuring the mesh. So for this, we're going to use this profile manager tool. Okay, so here we have three options. We can start a completely new profile. We can connect to an existing profile if we've created one already. Or if we have created a profile in the past and lost the, all the machines that had the data about that profile stored on them were lost, well, we can recover that data from the mesh. What we're going to do now is we're going to create a completely new profile for Alice because this is the first time that she's done it. And she's going to call it Alice1. Okay. So the first thing it does is to ask whether she wants to connect her various applications to the web, sorry, to the mesh, because she might already have a password manager. She might already have email security. Just because she wants the, the mesh to manage one of her applications doesn't mean she wants to use to, it to manage them all. So the mesh can be used to manage usernames and passwords for websites. And it's a very good tool for that because unlike a lot of the proprietary systems out there, all the code is open source, all the protocols are open standards, they can be audited, they can be reviewed and all the control is with Alice all the time. If she wants to change and use a different uh, provider she can do that at any time and Alice's data is only encrypted using keys that she controls. There's no way that anybody else can get access to that data unless she wants to. So we'll choose that, yes. Uh, does she want to use the mesh to secure email? Obviously she does because that's the point. 
Uh, in theory, we could also use the mesh to configure OpenBGP. Right now, we only do SMIME. And it's asking her whether she wants to use the mesh with each of the accounts that are that she's configured her email client for. And what's happened here is that the profile manager has gone into the machine and read the settings for Windows Live Mail, which is the mail client we're using for this demonstration. And it's extracted the list of accounts and it's going to ask her about each one in turn because she might want to have encryption on one of her accounts and not the others. So yes, she wants to do that. And now it's going to ask her about recovery keys. When you use strong encryption to secure your digital assets, you can prevent people from reading that data, reading confidential data that you don't want them to read. But it's a double-edged source sword. If you lose control of your encryption keys, you can't get access to that data anyway, either. And nobody can get it back for you. So the way that we get around that problem is recovery keys. You see, the thing is that what you want, depending upon the type of data you have, usually your primary concern with data is to make sure that you can get it back when you want it. And the fear that it might be disclosed to some other party is secondary. That's not always the case, of course. I do have some data that I want to be destroyed and lost forever rather than have it fall into the hands of the wrong person. But most people aren't like that. And so recovery keys are the way we go about it. So we say we're going to create the recovery keys. And now it's generating the cryptographic profile. And it comes back with a profile fingerprint. I'll come explain that in a moment. And these three recovery shares. If Alice starts the profile manager on a completely blank machine and gives any two of those three codes to the machine, that data and the data that's stored encrypted in the mesh can be used to recover her profile. So what this means is that if Alice has stored all her digital assets in the cloud, encrypted, all the pictures of her children since they were three, um, all her life documents, uh, all her novels that she's written, uh, all that personal data, she can be assured that she can get it back provided she can just get two out of those three recovery codes uh, back. And so she might give one to her parents, she might keep one in the bank, a bank account, she might have one in her house. But uh, correctly configured, this gives her a very good chance of getting back her digital assets, even if she loses everything in a fire, becomes a refugee or anything of that nature. Okay, so at this point, we have set up Alice's profile on one machine. And now let's see how we can use that with encrypted mail. So we start Windows Live Mail again. If you remember at the start, when we looked at the uh, security tab, these certificate entries were empty. And that's why we couldn't send an encrypted mail message to ourselves. So now if we go back into the account and read that same message, and we'll reply encrypted. And now we can select encryption and digital signature and send the message and we don't get any complaints back. And when we go and look at it, we can read it. And if you look here, it says digitally signed and verified, encrypted with the trusted digital ID. We're now sending and receiving encrypted data. Nobody can look at that data apart from Alice and the person she sent it to, which is me in this case. Uh, this is what we call end-to-end -end security. So we've configured emails. Uh, we've so at this point we've configured Alice's secure email, but we've only done it for one machine. And in the modern age, that's really not enough because you know Alice, she's a she's an engineer. She has a phone. She has a tablet. She has a laptop. 
she might be like me, she has multiple ones. I have five different devices that I read my mail on regularly. And so I need an email encryption system that allows me to get access to my mail on every one of them. And what that means is that I need to have the decryption keys available on any one of them. And the mesh allows us to do this. So what I have here is um, a cheap laptop that I bought off Amazon last week. It's uh, the lowest price, cheapest laptop I could find. And the reason I chose this one was that I wanted to be able to show that the mesh works at an acceptable speed, even on the cheapest, lowest power devices that are out there today. You don't need to have the fastest desktop on the market to run the mesh you can use a really low power computer. So as you can see here, there's no email account in configured at all. So what Alice is going to do here, she is going to first of all install the mesh tools. Okay. Next thing she's going to do is she's going to run the connect tool and the connect tool is basically a mini version of the administrative tool that will only allow her to connect to an existing profile it doesn't allow her to create one as you can see this is this was instant on the other machine it takes a little while on this one so now she gives her mesh profile account number this one and the first thing it's doing here is asking her to check her profile fingerprint and what this is about is Alice wants to make sure that only that she is connecting her new laptop to her profile and not some profile that's uh, created by say um, the evil killer robot that's standing in the corner there. So to do this, she's going to check that the profile fingerprints are the same on both machines. So on the new machine, it's reporting that the profile fingerprint is uh, MATXR. Yeah, and on the desktop here, we have MATXR, and then it continues ML616AW. Yes, it's the same on both devices. So at this point she's she's verified one of the two things she needs to do to be assured she's connecting to the right profile which is making sure that this machine is connecting to the right profile. Now that's not the end of the matter. The next thing we need to do, so I'll accept that, the next thing we need to do is on her desktop she's going to go to it to check to see if there's any connection attempts pending and now she's got to do the same thing in reverse. Just as she wants to make sure that her laptop was connected to the right profile, she wants to make, when she's approving that request, she wants to make sure that she's re approving the request from the laptop and not some random piece of hardware that's just trying to get to access. And again, we have a profile fingerprint. This time it's MBWUS. Yes, it's the same on both, so we accept. And the, the, then we go back to the first one, check to see whether the connection has been approved. Yes, it's been approved. And at this point, everything is done. We go into Windows Live Mail. And you can see it's now got an account, an email account. And if we go into that account and look at the properties, it's got her encryption certificate and a signature certificate attached. So what we've shown here is two things. First of all, it was really easy for Alice to get her cryptographic configuration information into that new machine. But secondly, she was able to use it to initialize it with her email account. And you can imagine that if the mesh is um, an infrastructure, that is being supported by every mail client, every messaging client, every telephone client, every video client, every cloud storage client, all the 
applications that might need cryptography, all the network applications that might need configuration. She can do all her configuration all in one go. In fact, it we could even configure the Mesh Profile Manager. You know, the Connect tool could have also known to pull down the clients that she likes, the applications that she likes from uh, the various sources and install those on the, her new machine. So this is where I get back to making the computer easier to use. Because what's making the computer hard to use today is the fact that we have all these different machines, but they're really not part of one single digital identity. And if we don't get a, a handle on that soon, we're going to be scuppered because the problem's getting harder. Computers are getting cheaper. Uh, this is a Raspberry Pi. You may have heard of the Pi Zero, which now costs $5. Computers are popping up all over the place. They're in your dishwasher. They're going to be in your clothes machine so that the clothes washer can run at night when the electricity is cheap, or it can run during the day uh, when people are out of the house and don't need to listen to it. Uh, you've got computers in your thermostats now. You're going to have them in every light switch. But that can't happen without creating an internet security disaster unless we have strong cryptography built in. And so the mesh is an infrastructure that gives us a handle on managing that strong cryptography. So that's, de that's the demonstration of the mesh and how it works. I hope you liked it. If you did like it, and if you want to see something like this happen on the internet, on the web, please like this video because the more people who are looking at this, talking about this type of technology, and telling Apple and Microsoft and Google and all the other technology providers that they want to have it built into their computers, the more likely we are to ha have that happen. So thank you for watching. And in the next podcast, what I'm going to be doing is to explain a bit about the rationale for the mesh and why it is designed the way it is, and a bit more about what was happening behind the scenes in this demonstration. Thank you for watching, and as I say, if you want to see this happen, please like this video. Thank you.